So <laughs> don't let any NASCAR team owner who owns a fifty million dollar charter and flew down on their private jet and stayed in their Prevost for a week in Daytona try to convince you <laughs> that wrecking the car in Daytona is, is something but, that's going to put them out of business. Uh, we're live. Welcome, Money Lap Podcast. I'm Parker Klugman, joined as always by Landon Castle. Uh, right now, I'm coming to you from North Carolina. Um, if you're watching us on YouTube, I apologize for the awful setting you find me in. I'm, I've had to mix noise deadening with light and made trade offs on both uh, to try and make some sort of podcast setup here that somewhat resembles something you'd want to listen to on the audio version. Um, hey, La- Landon, what, what day is it? Where are we now? I, I feel like I was in Daytona for 15 weird. weeks. <laughs> um, it does feel like – does it feel like a Tuesday or feel like a Wednesday? Or not, it definitely even, doesn't feel like a Wednesday. Yeah, I can't figure it out. I don't even know. I'm what, off yeah, by a day two, not because I was stuck in Daytona in the rain, but because mm. the Castle family, like all good Americans, celebrated President's Day in Monticello to visit Thomas Jefferson's. Uh, oh wow! Home. So that was kind no of fun. Way. We had a good, a very nice educational trip for the kids, and we enjoyed it. It was a good time. I've actually always wanted to go to that. I drove by it when I did that trip to the diplomatic security services that will be out on the Utopian here soon. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, man, I want to go see that. So it was, was really it, cool. Was it cool? We did a little bit of Americana stuff as well. Speaking of delays, what what'd you do? So went to the Kennedy Space Center. Oh, yeah, um, I've done that before. It was really cool because I it's always been a bucket list item of my of myself to see a Saturn V rocket in person. You know, the largest, most complex machine humans have ever built, basically. Now mm-hmm. it's been it's been surpassed in terms of size by SpaceX recently, but still it's probably the most complex. It's like three million parts on this thing. Um and I finally saw one in person, which was cool. My girlfriend came and a couple of my team members so that was a lot of fun. The beginning part of the Kennedy Space Center was my worst nightmare. It's basically like Disney World meets space. <laughs> it um, is a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, and I was like, wait a second. I was very disappointed, and I was like, I think we've made a huge mistake. Everything had a line. If anyone ever tells you that it's a short line and that line is 60 minutes, immediately walk away and know that there's nothing on the other side of that that's worth you waiting 60 minutes. I can guarantee you there's <laughs> absolutely nothing on the other side that's worth 60 minutes. Um, but then we went to the Saturn V rocket area, and that was more museum like, which is more my style, and I, I enjoyed it. So felt very American, pumped up about the American space program. We're going back to the moon, Artemis. That's gonna be cool. Should we do the PR lap? We basically just sort of kicked it off and talked about ourselves for a bit. Let's do it. Um, yeah, we got some reviews. We do have some reviews. So this one we couldn't remember if we talked about it on the pod or we all just celebrated it within internally. Uh, at the money lap, but this one on Apple reviews was tremendous. So if we have said it already, you know what? It's so damn good. We're reading it twice. Um, <laughs> so this one is titled money lap over the Dale junior download. Sorry, Dale. We do love you from Trent PD. This has become one of my most anticipated podcasts every week. Great knowledge of the sport given in a way that doesn't confuse or talk down to listeners. Great personalities, all, and even better ad reads. Even found myself going down a wormhole of race finish reaction videos off their YouTube channel while the rest of my house was watching the Super Bowl. (laughs) When many other NASCAR podcasts have become inflated with nonsense just to have more content, the money lap keeps it right where it needs to be. Good info, good host, good content, and a good time listening. Thanks, fellas. Uh, that is a that is wonderful. That was it's the best amazing. one we've ever had. For a couple, <laughs> for a couple reasons. First of all, I got to shout out the when many other NASCAR podcasts inflated with nonsense. Who <laughs> are they talking about? I don't know. Mm, um, can't figure it out. But <laughs> the the doesn't confuse or talk down to listeners. I appreciate that because we're just being ourselves here. Yep. That's all it is. Is just me and you talking about race cars. So I appreciate um, that that our listeners can are keeping up with what we're saying. Yeah. Uh, because we're not trying to do anything special here. I'm just trying to talk about race cars the way we talk about race cars to anybody. Love that. And uh, it's just very nice when someone gets it. They just get it, and you're just like, "Yep, 
We nailed it. Thank you. Uh, that's exactly what this is about. We just like we love race cars and love talking about racing, and this is what you get to hear. We happen to we happen to hit record. Uh, Spotify. Todd Gillery, great episode. I've never had never heard of the Safari Porsches. Looked them up, and they're awesome cars. Thanks, guys. He's talking about the Safari Porsches from Lee Keen, the Keen Project. My buddy there. Those are sweet. Go check them out. YouTube. No feedback really, other than an hour is too short. Thanks for the shout out, guys. Uh, Chad Akins, I remember when Landon ran his ASA car at New Smyrna with no sway bar on the bump stops. Boy had balls. Well done, Landon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And uh, that's like a I, week wor- a worth of racing and one track will do for you is you just keep making adjustments. <laughs> next thing you know, we kept, we kept backing off the sway bar, backing off the sway bar. Next thing you know, we just took the sway bar out of it. Um, I kind of love fast. that. That's always a fun time because you just keep refining, refining. And then there's also those times, though, that you go to places like that and you're there for a week and you get that car further and further out. And the next thing you know, just go back to where you started. And yep, it's the best it'll ever be. Left turn 99. Landon's mic is in focus. His face, not so much. That's because we want you to hear him. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, love that I should give up um, some more anecdotal evidence that people are actually listening out there. Every five seconds at Daytona, I was stopped once again with people saying they love the money lap, which is awesome. Uh, so we very much appreciate that. And once again, you know, like at the Rolex, I'm, I, I'm very flattered you all listen. So thank you, and it's nice to hear that in person from any of you out there. Um, one thing I did want to bring up in the PR lab, I saw it on Twitter today, and it's an article by Awful Announcing, which we haven't made it on with the money lap yet, but... One of these days, we'll know we made it when they do an article about us on Awful do Announcing. Do we want to be on Awful Announcing, or do we not want yeah, to be no, on Yeah, no, it's, it's actually a good thing. No, it's a good thing. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's like it's like the place you want to – it's like a rite of passage to be on Awful Announcing. I've had interviews okay. with them. They do their own podcast, but they, they kind of judge all the sports media and just media in general. Nonetheless, uh, they had a really interesting article over something that went down between J.J. Redick, who's the – NBA player who kind of he has his own podcast he sort of initiated this whole idea of like player owned podcasts that's just stuff that we're seeing take over NASCAR and Stephen A. Smith who was like it's up to the players to educate the fan base on what's happening and he just went off and he's like is it really is it really up to the players he's like I'm pretty sure that's my job being in the media and his point was he goes look if I do a a video about how this team technically used a player and they did it 10 times over blah 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 he goes, it gets about 54,000 people to watch. No one gives a shit. He goes, but if I get on here and I just spout off ranking players, 10 million engagements. He's like, do they really want to see that? Is that what they want to see? And I thought it was fun for, uh, for us to discuss on the motorsports side because you and I go back and forth on this. I know, and you know, if we got on here and we just said, Max Verstappen sucks and here's why, and Denny Hamlin does this wrong, and you, you know, here's 10 reasons you need to rank all these drivers and that sort of bullshit – we'd have 10 times the audience, or the clicks at least. But we try to be more thorough and to talk just about what we authentically talk about. And I think that's where all these, you know, is the whole sport, especially in motorsports right now. And you look at NASCAR drivers who all are about to have their own podcast and they're all going to have, you know, their own form of, of putting their media out there, toting that line of being authentic, being themselves versus the stuff that the algorithms and that sort of stuff want the clicks from. Does this make, if I gone anywhere that makes sense of this? I think you have. I think that it's starting, I'm, I've got my wheels are turning and that's why I'm st- kind of staring blankly. And it's because you, you kind of unlocked something for me that we've already been saying. And, th- and it's that we are not, we don't see ourselves as a reaction studio, even though well, I guess we have a whole reaction si- series to videos. <laughs> so I got <laughs> We just, just filmed just, another just, reaction. Just, if we an indie car literally just filmed a reaction video, so uh, that's not exactly <laughs> what I mean. But like a reaction studio in terms of just reacting for likes and things like that. Um, maybe there might here and there. I mean, obviously we're topical and we're up with current news, so there's there's going to be some level of reaction to things. But it's not just with the sole purpose of you know trying to stoke the fires as much as. I think that our unspoken goal or objective between us here is to deeper deepen our understanding of racing. Like yeah. we're trying to have conversations with each other to deepen our understanding of racing. 
we both have a really good understanding of what's going on, but we don't know everything, right? And it's fun, legitimately fun. It might be boring for some people. I don't know. It's legitimately fun for me, and I know it is for you too because that's why we're friends and that's why we have a podcast to talk about this stuff, right? Yep. Like when we have a theory about why do, um, you know, we're going to talk about bump drafting here in a little bit, and why do you know, driver pay or, or you know, racing theory, driving styles. Like we like to talk about that stuff to deepen our understanding about it. And, and I guess we just hope that there's other people that want to listen to that. I yep. don't know. Um, is that going to draw the biggest audience? I don't know. Is that what JJ Reddick is kind of saying? He's and like, I'm not trying to, he's like, I, I'm, I'm, you know, maybe he like enjoys I don't know. It's. Uh, I think. Well, he's also now part of the media, and so he's sort of like that's our job, right? Like the players. Oh, I see what you're saying. You know, and like I agree. I you know I think in in motorsports for so long, the the trope, especially in NASCAR, has been blame the personality of the drivers or lack thereof from some or this sort of thing or blame that they don't do enough and that sort of stuff. And I'm like, hey, at some point you got to flip the mirror backwards and be like, hey. What about all the people that are surrounding this thing that could do a better job talking about the sport and diving deeper into it and that sort of thing like we've done here? You know, we tote the line of being active drivers, me a part of the media as well. Like, that's probably on me a little bit, right, at times to mm-hmm. not have done this earlier and do all the, the informational stuff we do about the sport. And when we talk about driving styles and then we make clips out of it and that goes is, and gets is this put a around. New, is this a new expectation on I think not so. just NASCAR, but like, and is it a new expectation because of social media and technology that the athletes now have such a direct line to their fans that now yes. people are just saying, hey, it's on you, right? I'm, I'm just picturing when you're describing all this, I was like, did people expect Dale Earnhardt to have that to educate <laughs> fans too? Yeah. Like, no, that's maybe a that is point. what, what Reddick is saying that makes sense. JJ Reddick, not Tyler Reddick, but, um, Good clarification. I guess what you're saying that he said makes sense to me is that back before social media, we had beat reporters that their responsibility was to get these drivers' messages out to yep. the mass, right? Yep. And I, I think it is new, and it's it's gonna get it's gonna get even more interesting as every you know there is no longer Sports Center as a as a style of show is going away like it's it's gonna you know now at some point everything more things change the more they stay the same it's just like what's happening in the streaming world where they're all going to join back together and soon you're going to have one payment to eight different streamers that is just like cable and you'll have a a guide that tells you when the live stuff is on and you know it's all going to come back the same i think for the sports world you know Yes, it's going to continue to fractionalize in terms of the the sources being a little different in terms of Denny Hamlin have his own podcast, Corey LaJoy, you know, Bubba Wallace will start one, Ryan Blaney's had one, we have one, that sort of thing. But I think with that is because you you point out it's such a direct line to fans. If you're if you're a fan of us, you can hear from us directly every week our thoughts and everything. Because of that there's some of this media that's like, well, it's on them to use that platform to educate fans on the sport and why they should be listening. It's like, well, I don't think that's their job. Like, that's not – they're trying to give them an inside scoop to what is their life and to be bigger fans of them, maybe not just the sport. So it's an odd – it's a really – well, it's not It's a very interesting discussion. I don't know where it goes. Um, but I saw that, and I was like, damn, that is – that's pretty good. You know, one thing I'll just bring up – that we try to avoid on this podcast and we will continue to. And if you want to hear this, you can go other places, but that is, and I want to use a different word here, but I'll be PG damn rumors. I could get on here and give you 15 rumors right now. that are 99% true, 90% true, but it's <laughs> not my place to tell you them. And it won't be my place because that is just not the way this all works yet. There are lots that I know that we clip those and put them out there. They will do insane numbers. But my pack to use, I won't do that. So here's my here's my nuanced answer to this. I'm gonna do this the best I can here. I think it's an athlete's job to just be themselves. I think exactly. that's what they owe to the fans. Yeah. I think that's what athletes owe to the fans is to be authentic. Because that is what this world needs. And I think that that's what 
people generally, especially in real life scenarios, respond the best to is just authentic people and authentic celebrities. Your most famous and best people, I think, are some of the most authentic. And so from an athlete's perspective, if an athlete wants to be an athlete and doesn't want to be on social media, doesn't want to spread a message, doesn't want to build too big of a brand for themselves, wants to perform on the field, on the court, on the racetrack, and they can make their business work by doing that, then that's who they are, right? I don't think you can Mm – I don't think they owe it to anybody to be something they're not, right? Yep. If an athlete chooses to be an athlete and also wants to be a celebrity or, you know – have a podcast or take this take on a further and deeper role of educating their fans or whatever that means right about the sport or spreading the word about their sport and they're able to make their business work that way too then they're gonna their their career is gonna go down a different path um even if they might be in the same sport Mm -hmm. i think the i think in, in anything this these days um what anybody owes to anything to anybody else is just authenticity so Amen. Uh, I agree with that 100%. That's the root of it all. It just be your, you know, if you're being your authentic self, genuine, people feel that they they build off that energy and it's the best mm-hmm. damn thing you can do. And don't let anyone tell you to go any which way. Just be what's most comfortable you be most comfortable you be yourself. That is that is probably the answer and it's something that I think we, you know, the the podcast platform etc for NASCAR specifically and a lot of the people there it's, it's allowed some of those people, you know, are doing it to be them their authentic selves, like Denny. Yeah, and it's worked for them. So there's yeah. your there's your template. And, and really, I mean, honestly, if you want to talk about authenticity, then you need to look no further than spoilerdiecast.com for the most high quality, <laughs> authentic diecast and apparel in motorsports. One of the fastest growing companies in the industry. SpoilerDieCast.com prides themselves on exceptional service. All order ships either same or next day, ensuring you get your hands on your favorite products in no time. And here's the best part. They have free shipping on orders over $20. That's right. You can enjoy smooth and affordable shopping experience with SpoilerDieCast.com. They have over 800 and going up unique products currently in stock. SpoilerDieCast.com boasts one of the largest inventories in the industry. They're NASCAR focused, but they have a wide range of diecast and apparel options from F1, dirt sprint cars, indie car, um, all kinds of stuff. Real race fans love the sport. Authentic people, authentic diecast. Go to spoilerdiecast.com. How was that for a transition? It was perfect. And they have my authentic, real, genuine diecast from the Spike Light Core Chevy at Big Machine Racing available. You can get my genuine and authentic autograph on that one. If you pay a little extra, use the code MONEYLAP. Go check it out, spoilerdiecast.com. I should say we didn't do any uh, preface to what you can expect on today's show. We are going to dive into all the things NASCAR from this past weekend, the Daytona 500, of course. We're going to evaluate the racing, talk some of the biggest topics coming out of that. Of course, the Xfinity race um, and all the all things surrounding NASCAR this weekend. And F1 just started testing today. Day one done this Wednesday, February 21st. So we're going to look at some of that. What's, what can we learn out of testing a bet? made by the Formula E CEO, friend of the pod, Jeff Dodds, that he put out there. A $250,000 <laughs> bet, by the way. Um, and some other little things we saw in the global motorsports sphere. Before we jump into that, Landon, uh, I just quickly need to mm-hmm. say that this weekend, I had probably one of the fastest super speedway cars I've ever had in my life. My big machine racing team, uh, led by Patrick Donahue and everyone there, did an excellent job in the all-season, bringing a incredibly fast car. We qualified fourth, but got in the first stage, finished third, didn't have a real opportunity to make a move on the 21, the two, because they, you know, be, them being teammates kind of had me in a, a position where if I was ever going right. to make a move at the end of the stage, I needed help. Justin Allgaier wasn't really in a position to go with me. And so we came down that late race restart. I chose the two on the top, uh, not late race, late stage i chose the two in the top <laughs> oh, because i gosh. felt like yeah so sad well i i chose him because i felt like at least be on the outside i could not i could control myself finishing third or second in the stage and not um but i knew we didn't really you know with a one lap push i didn't know i didn't think we could win it which we finished third in that stage and then we got mm-hmm. in stage two went to the restart went to the middle 
And as I did, I saw John Hunter up there, and I thought, oh, this is a good lane to be in, a bunch of good cars. And then <laughs> all hell broke loose. John Hunter spun, let Jesse love. The wreck happens. I had it totally avoided, and, and I'm watching uh, A.J. Allmendinger spin in front of me. And I'm like, oh, okay, he'll spin to the inside. I'm just going to drive right through this. No problem. As it's happening, I'm literally doing nothing. I'm just on the brake, letting AJ clear out, and then I'm going to accelerate away from this thing. As there's chaos happening around, I'm, I'm, everything slowed down, as you know, and I'm like, okay, I know my way out. At that moment, suddenly, bam, someone nails me in the right rear. I don't know ah. who yet. And it spun us into the wall. That put a bunch of damage there. We were able to cut all that off, but we went two laps down. And even missing the splitter, we were so fast i could have driven through the field anytime i wanted with the front end mangled the 21 showed that when and i i he's a good super speedway racer but let me just tell you our three cars the two the 21 the 48 were so damn fast that driving through the field would have been on easy mode because it was like even with all the damage i had i had to work very hard to not find myself driving through the pack and hmm. it was just like this is unbelievable so why did you lose so many laps? Was it the uh, the sway bar or we know the splitter was pushed back the 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 bars the bumper bars were pushed back into the right front tire. So even though it was such a soft hit into the wall, it just completely hit it the way that it. And I think the ninety seven sort of got me as well, Shane, at the same time, and it just sort of collapsed the right front. And so the our picker guys just had a tough time clearing seeing it. And so if we go back out. We probably popped the right front immediately, and they just couldn't get it clearance where they felt they could put the right front on and not have it cut it right mm -hmm. away. So it, we went two laps down, which normally wouldn't be such a bad deal if you get a lot of wrecks, which there were, but just for whatever reason. have them at the right time. Well, yeah, every time you have a wreck, right it puts time. people lap down and gets you back in yep. front. Yep. So that hurt us, but we had a fast car. We got some points out of it. We actually left there, I believe, one spot better in points than we did last year at this time. <laughs> So oh, making one whole year, one whole year, <laughs> big improvement, baby. Let's go. <laughs> oh, man. That was, um, well, that was a bummer. Brutal. It is, but we we'll hopefully have the same speed at Atlanta, and uh, it was felt good to get back in it. And let's see what we can bring there. We, we came close to winning the spring race last year, and we had winning speed in the summer race. So we'll go get it done. That'll make it all the sweeter mm -hmm. and all the better. Um, moving on. There was a big yeah, race let's... before ours, by the way. We were, you know, we were the headliner this past weekend in the Xfinity <laughs> series. Nine o'clock Monday night, you know. It was nice to let's have talk a, a about cute the racing this weekend. I well, it was a cute had... opening act for us in the Daytona 500. Yeah, it was cute. Um, I just we can get right into the racing of it because I see that in our notes to talk about it. There's drivers frustrated with fuel saving, kind of um, just thoughts on the race weekend, thoughts on the finishes. I had this, and you know this from we we haven't actually talked since until this podcast, uh, which is highly unusual. But we had you. I know that you saw my texts in one of our group threads uh, with someone who will not be named. But um, <laughs> I just had this overwhelming sense of sadness about the racing this weekend, and I know that part of it is because of the weather, and we got delayed, and we didn't get to have Daytona Day which is like the best day of the year. Um, Daytona 500 in the daylight. Well, it wasn't the daylight, but I mean on a Sunday afternoon. But I just had this overwhelming sense of sadness on just what we're seeing in speedway racing right now. Bumps me out. Yep. And it's that there's so much strategy and there's so it speedway racing is so tactical and it's so interesting. And I actually, the, the, the fuel saving is the least of my worries. I think the fuel saving makes it interesting, right? I'm not, I'm not against the fuel saving. I, I don't like the stages necessarily, um, but the fuel saving doesn't bother me at all. It's the fact that there is very little risk to be the one bump drafting, to be the hard bump drafter. Mm -hmm. The car's are sturdy the bumpers are rigid the bumpers line up relatively speaking and so if you are i don't even know the bumper not the bumpy the one giving the bump not the one receiving the bump 
there's no risk. You hit them as hard as you can, as hard as you want. Yep. The and and there's a various amount of things could happen out of that. And at the bottom of that list is you getting wrecked, right? Or your car <laughs> getting damaged. Mm-hmm. The other guy might wreck. Your lane advances. Everybody goes faster. You lock bumpers and you start super drafting. Uh, <laughs> you you know, you bump the guy out of the way and he moves out and you can jam middle on him and pass him. All these great things can come out of aggressive bump drafting, but there's no risk for the guy doing it. And so I think it just it is like over so many years of this style of racing, it's just been ratchet. The aggression is just ratcheting up and ratcheting up and ratcheting up to the point where every single speedway race in cup and in Xfinity ends in just pure chaos and destruction. Yep. And you throw all, almost all of the tactics out the window. The, the strategy of, go- like, the racecraft is gone. Not in completely gone. I'm not trying to be too dramatic. There's still a lot of racecraft, but it's hard to point out the racecraft when 12 cars wreck in the last 10 laps of every race. Mm-hmm. Right? It's hard to find the racecraft in that. Yep. And it just is like heartbreaking to me because we saw so, there's such a good race. There's so much talent and so much skill in the cup series that's going on right now. And there's so much preparation that goes into it and strategy and strategy and the side drafting and how to get in which lanes. The best racing is, is mile one to 400 or 450, you know, <laughs> well, mm-hmm. no, even longer than that, 495 probably. And then it's just, at the end, the last they yep. throw the white flag and they just all destroy each other. What do you think changed? What do you think's different? It's the biggest thing to me is is the the biggest thing. There's a lot of different things. The biggest thing to me is the risk versus reward of being a bumper, not a bumpy. And it's it's I think it's too low risk. It just you're incentivized as the bump drafter person to just push the hell out of people. Your car is very well protected. Your radiator is protected. Your hood is protected. I mean, you know, it was back with steel bodied and thin fiberglass front bumpers. If you hit someone too hard, it'd fold your hood in, right? It'd fold the radiator. You you break your ductwork, right? Your car would overheat. You'd poke a hole in the radiator. Your your valence would, you'd you'd crush the, the front valence. But everything is so rigid and so durable now that you can just hit people as hard as you want and you can knock them out of control, right? So it's just what they do to each other. You can stick your nose in between two cars and if somebody comes across your bumper and you turn them, it's not it's not going to do any damage to your car. Yeah. And, and, I mean, you've heard me say this and a lot of people have heard me say this and I'll com- com- continue to repeat it, but the safest place to be the truly safest place to be in a wreck at a super speedway is to be the one causing it (laughs) because the one that causes a wreck almost always gets through it. You Joe Logano would agree with you. His quote, uh, after his crash, it's usually guys who start the wreck that survive. That's the frustrating part. Yeah. Every time. So if you just start thinking about the game theory here and the incentive structure, and then if you believe that, if you buy into my whole theory about all this and then go back and watch the last 10 super speedway races, you're going to see it and go, oh, okay, that's why it's just ratch- ratcheting up and ratcheting up and ratcheting up. Yep. And I, I just don't see it changing. I think we might see some good races here and there, some clean finishes here and there. But by and large, they're going to continue just making low percentage moves at the end of these races to try to get a win. And I'm, I'm, I think we should point out that's, you know, part of what you see in the next gen era is the fuel saving, right? We, we talked about it last week before I said, if I was going to go pit report, I knew every single crew chief was going to talk to me about fuel saving, right? If it shortens the stops, it makes your track position late in the race better. That's how the 24 got in position to be where he was late in the race. Because they fuel saved like crazy. You have guys like Denny Hammond who've gotten out and said, this sucks. I don't want to ride around like this for 450 miles. Which then, to your point, you get later in the race and you've ridden around and now it's go time. And you just start slamming people because there's no risk, right? And you haven't even done it with any finesse before then. 
So that mm-hmm. that part's sort of out there. So now your 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 sense for what is a hard hit and not is not great. Um, and sort of this all lines up to what you're talking about, which is then it becomes a just series of hail mary, low percentage, doesn't matter moves because you have nothing to lose. And I guess my where I'm going with this is to point out, you know, this is this is very different than it was just three, four years ago, right? This this super speedway racing is so funny because it's it is definitely a a probably a great um, experiment, social experiment, right? for understanding group think and group theory as to why it changes and as people figure things out and discover different types of drafting or strategies and that sort of thing that make a difference how can you utilize those to be in the best position late right and that's and you know once someone figures something out then everyone figures it out and it all changes the way the super speed racing is so what's the fix here like how do Forever, it's been oh, we wreck a ton of shit. These things, okay, got that. Uh, that's just gonna that's gonna be the nature of having cars going two hundred miles an hour next to each other and having to make contact to make passes. Like you literally have to bump someone to make a pass. There's gonna be an error, you know, an element of of error there that will induce wrecks. That's just normal, and those wrecks are gonna be big because all the cars are right next to each other. So that's that's a given. But to bring some of the finesse, and also I think this whole fuel thing how do we solve this so that you're racing the whole time plus how do you bring back the finesse without changing the car right because you can't i don't know i don't i mean i well, i guess the reason i just said i don't know is because i want i want to change the car <laughs> <laughs> but i don't it's not fair for me to just throw out some half baked fix to this. Yep. I I'm just trying to point out I guess my first step is to point out what I've already pointed out, which is I believe and you said the past three or four years, but I believe that this has been something that has started over a decade ago and it's just been building and building and building. Right? It started when we bu- lined up the bumpers with the C O T car. And then over time the bumper structures in the front of those cars have only gotten stronger. Right, mm-hmm. they've only gotten sturdier. The quality of material has only gotten better to the point where now we're we're driving a next gen car where, you know, it's it's twice as strong and sturdy in the front bumper structure as even the Gen Seven was or the Gen Six. Yep. So you know that's it's it's taken a lot of time, and the drivers have adapted to that over time. We've, they've continued to push the issue more and more and more in terms of what they can get away with pushing each other and bump drafting. And then the other thing too is you got to keep in mind that we've we've discovered how good bump drafting can be for speed, right? So that has further increased the team's desire to strengthen bumpers and make things sturdy and um you know the rear bumpers are sturdier to because to withstand harder pushes and then they start using slick tape on the front and rear bumpers so that you can push harder without the bumper sticking and the car's getting it. So it's just like, it's just a snowball effect of catering to hard bump drafting, right? Mm. What is the fix? I don't, I don't know. I mean, yeah, okay, I'll throw out some cheap half-baked suggestion that we should just go back to steel, thin steel bodies that if you bump <laughs> someone with a reasonable amount of force, it's going to damage both cars right and and also bumpers that didn't line up right back then you literally jack someone, pick someone up. up off the ground yeah you, that, that's that's a saying that actually meant something back in the day pick the rear rear wheels up off the ground because you could literally drive underneath the fuel cell of someone's car and now the penalty to that and you can go back and watch all kinds of video from short track racing even super speedway racing you know of someone's hood being folded under because they drove underneath someone too far, right? There's a penalty to that. You damaged your car. You pay the price, yep. right? You wouldn't do that um, nowadays. So to me, that is that's something has to balance that to to have a fix. Something has to slow that down to get rid of the bump draft or to soften the bump drafting. It's not that bump drafting is bad. You know, we watched we just watched did a reaction video of a early two thousands IRL race from Chicago. Um, and that's the other end of the spectrum, right? Those are cars that are so, so dangerous around each other. If they touch that you would send someone out or space. 
Um, you don't, I don't think we want that. You know, those drivers couldn't make a move on each other because it's so dangerous. The penalty of, of making contact is so high. Yeah. So you want to be somewhere. We are on the opposite end of that spectrum. If IndyCar racing at a super speedway is here, or IRL at Chicago Land or Fontana or whatever is here, NASCAR is on the opposite end of the spectrum right now where we can bump and make aggressive moves with just very little risk. Yeah. The risk is on everybody else. Hmm. Well, to your point about the uh, risk, and one of your favorite things that happens out of Super Speedway Racing is everyone saying, well, when we wreck all this stuff, what does it cost? I <laughs> had a person who remained nameless tell me that this is Team Penske alone was around $1.3 in estimated damage <laughs> across their Oof. cars and speed weeks. <laughs> that hurts. <laughs> $28 million <laughs> prize purse, apparently, though, from uh, for the Daytona 500, making it the most lucrative race in motorsport history. Yeah. We can, yeah, we can it was decipher a that one. High paying race. Um, you know, I do have a, a, a grounding comment about the whole wrecked race cars. And we always come from these and say, oh, um, you know, look how much money this race costs the team owners. Um, and absolutely, it did. Wrecked race cars cost money no matter how you how you cut it except I can promise you that these race team owners who operate their businesses in a very professional manner and they all have CFOs and accountants um, that plan ahead and budget, these race seasons are budgeted for crash damage. So <laughs> don't let any NASCAR team owner who owns a $50 million charter and flew down on their private jet and stayed in their Prevost for a week in Daytona try to convince you <laughs> that wrecking the car in Daytona is uh, um, is something was, that's going to put them out of business. Was a shock. First race of the season. It was also a shock. <laughs> I can't believe it. I can't yeah, I can't believe it. it. It was a shock. Oh, my gosh. We Of all the things we prepared for, we didn't prepare for our car to get wrecked. Speaking uh, of clickbait, there you go. That's our next headline. <laughs> Team owners shocked by damage incurred in Super Speedway Racing. Oh, really? I know. Were I they know. really? Have they done yeah. this before? <laughs> I think, I think um, there's probably... And I actually, I don't think I know because I've had these conversations with team owners. I've been on this side of things um, that uh, there are team owners that went out, left Daytona without a wrecked car that felt like their money ahead. Oh, yeah. And so yep. there is a, uh, <laughs> there are two sides to that going for sure. Well, if you just take the 28 million, what we decide? It's 700,000 per car, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that may be. Cars. I mean, that may be an and unfair. I tweeted that, and I think that well, might be an unfair totally way to. Yeah, because right. it's weighted to the front. You're gonna get three million right. to the winner, and it's like something's still like three hundred fifty grand or three hundred grand to start the damn race, which is right. wild. I don't think that's a so. very good represent. Even though I, those are my words that I tweeted, uh, but if, I don't think it's a very good representation of what's actually going on because it's an average is just an average. That's what it is. Yeah. Um, well, when you an tweeted that, car, though, but I had literally just before that done the math on the calculator. <laughs> I was like, oh, we're thinking alike. Love it. Well, um, meanwhile, in the truck series, uh, you probably your fix there is a license system. Good luck. Um, yeah, that race. I mean, I think the trucks help. actually for the bumper lineup thing. Um, I mean, it's it's a little it's better than the Xfinity and the Cup cars because they still have kind of the old school style bumper structure in those trucks. And so if you if you you know beat someone's bumper off too much early on in a race, it's going to penalize you. Yep. Um, it's going to affect it's gonna, your truck can overheat. You're going to lose some aerodynamics. Um, I think the problem with the truck series right now is like you said, I, I think that, um, a lot of those drivers are maybe underqualified for speedway racing. Um, and you know, need to spend some more time in the Arca series or, uh, you know, I think NASCAR, um, needs to tighten up their approval process. Uh, and just, you know, hold the drivers to a higher standard to be able to get into a top three series and race, you know, on the big stage like that. I think a licensing system, no different than iRacing, safety rating, all of it involved. I had a, a talk with a NASCAR official the day after, and he said, yep, I agree. So we'll see. Denny Hamlin said that if local short tracks can give you an end of the longest line for crash causers or people that cause too many cautions or just cause a caution in general, uh, NASCAR can too. Maybe that's a fix. You spin people out and cause 18 cars to be wrecked, go to the back of the line. Only problem with that, though, obviously it becomes a judgment call. And personally, I don't like race-controlled judgment calls. Yeah, I don't, like I don't think 
Um, not this level. Special. I'm not a fan of that. Um, and well, so I'll give you my my two sides here, as I typically as I often do. I'll give you my my side against it, and then I'll give you my idea on how if I wanted to get into it. Um, <laughs> my I'm not a fan of it because of what you said. It now it just puts another thing in a judgment call that puts another responsibility on NASCAR from the booth to make a judgment call. That's not always a good thing. Um, I think we should, if I were NASCAR, I would be avoiding those. Um, and I also, I also think that one of the most underappreciated things about NASCAR is that the drivers historically handled things on the racetrack, right? Yep. And that the and that point. NASCAR allowed it to happen. I think that was something that people don't appreciate about NASCAR for for decades, right? That there was no racing penalties. That just yep. drivers handled it like men and women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> they just just handled women. things and and men. and yeah, yeah. men and women and men and, you know, <laughs> adults. They handled things like adults, and um. You know, I think that that's where my view is more on the car as much as it is the policy or rules. Now, I could make an argument to say, okay, so if you wanted to have a rule like that, you could easily make it, I would say easily, nothing's easy, but you could make it as as low judgment call as possible by just saying, hey, anybody involved in a wreck, it goes to the back. Doesn't matter if you, yep. you know what I mean? Like, we're not going to, doesn't matter if the guy came down on you, if... Or if you made an aggressive move, if somebody spun off of your nose and we can identify contact, then you're going to the back. Boom. No fault. Just both That faults. would change things. That would be massive. That would have a massive effect. But I love what you just said, which is that historically NASCAR doesn't do that. And it is interesting because when you look at everything else in global motorsports, F1, way too much involvement too from much race control. It makes, IMSA, it makes they have it makes the regulators the star of the show. Yeah. It makes it makes the regulators the star of the show. It shouldn't be I think it suppresses the drivers potential to show their personalities um to to you know show their driving styles. I think we, that hey, you know remember, I think that beauty in NASCAR because we don't have a lot of regulations around drivers, their driving styles are visible, right? Yep. The aggressive ones, the conservative ones. We're not trying to put the drivers in a box and say, this is how you overtake. This is what a proper overtake looks like. No. Mm -hmm. Well, think to the – remember uh, when we did the Money Lab Lives and we had that supercars incident at Adelaide where they mm -hmm. gave him a five-second penalty, five penalty for just basically grazing the rear bumper of another driver in a stock car-based series. That's too <laughs> right. much. Just, too far. Yeah, Get out of here. Blasphemous. <laughs> Blasphemous. Yeah. Awful. Awful. Anyway, I think uh, – you know, it's going to be a discussion, and there's going to have to be some sort of change. I think the fuel saving thing is a change that can be made in terms of the stages or whatever. Maybe the stages don't have cautions on Swiss freeways. You know, maybe that helps the fuel saving thing. Maybe, maybe we just they're they're not. You know, when the caution comes out is is not told to you. I don't know. Something needs to change there because I don't I don't love that. Um, although it does look from the outside, I will say this: it does get look better than the single file line of the past before this where mm -hmm. even though they're running two by two by two at 40 you know 50 percent throttle and it's ridiculous and they're going so much slower to the fan who just tuned in because they watched netflix and is watching that compared to an f1 race their head is exploding mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like literally going and it absolutely is, is causing a combustion moment within their brain at that point in time as they watch lap after lap of cars side by side so i won't i won't say it's totally from the outside a bad thing but i get as being a driver you know mm -hmm. denny in the middle of that pack thinking this sucks i get it that would be very frustrating being held back from going as fast as you possibly could all the time um i don't i, I think my one my last point and then we can okay. move on about the fuel saving thing though is like i don't hate seeing all the fuel saving stuff because I I'm I like uh you know Tour de France and um cycling and the the idea of saving energy and you know I think that's kind of interesting. So 
Hmm. I don't hate it. Yeah, you and like three other people. Good luck with that. <laughs> I guess. I guess. So I would like to point out some winners and losers. We never really did this on the podcast, but I used to do this back in the NASCAR America days. And I thought starting with the Daytona 500 would be a good one where just looking at the finishing order, you try and pick out one or two people, drivers, that have had a day you would consider a win. And my, my theory around this was back – uh, when we were doing NASCAR America, and there was a lot of people from the football world, I said, you know, what's interesting about NASCAR is that unlike the NFL, where you have multiple winners on any given weekend because they only play one other team, all our all our teams play at the same time. But somebody in there was the Browns beating the Patriots, basically. And I don't know if that makes any sense, but you get my point <laughs> of saying mm-hmm. somebody in there won. Uh, maybe they didn't get to check their flag, but they had a winning day at the top of the sport. So just real quickly, some names that popped up. Uh, Corley Joy, of course, finishing fourth. That's a big day for them. Big day for him. Uh, John Hunter Nemechek with a top 10, seventh place. That's a good one. And Noah Gregson in the top 10. Those would be my winners that I saw out there that I thought that's a pretty mm-hmm. solid. Those are pretty big days in a big race um, in the Daytona 500. Some losers, some ones that got away from them. I have to think Harrison Burton involved in that wreck on lap five. That's a big blow. Big important year for him. Uh, in the 21 car, you know, hasn't had the the best performances in the last two years. Really needs a solid year. Mm-hmm. To start off the year with that sort of a, even though it wasn't his fault at all, was in a good position, doing the right things. It's just that's never fun. Um, and Michael McDowell, front row in general, actually. Michael McDowell, so fast in speed weeks, in a great position. He has the mechanical issues. Finishes 36, and Todd Gilland, his teammate, led 16 laps in the Daytona 500. Finishes 35th. That's two big losers on the Brutal. day. That that hurts. I don't know if there's anyone else you saw. No, I mean I think that was probably a heartbreaker. McDowell was a heartbreaker for me watching, just being like that was a. I mean he's won the race before, which is amazing, but this was probably the first time that he actually felt like he had a car to win it, right? Yep. Um, and he legitimately did. And it mm-hmm. wasn't even... Uh, Michael can be an aggressive driver and can get himself in trouble. His trouble this week wasn't even any of his doing, really. No, no. It just That's a just shame. Uh, but in the good news category for them, they did before the 500 announce that they renewed Love's Travel Stop for multiple years uh, mm-hmm. in the 2024 season, which is the first time they've done it for more than one year since they aligned in 2013. Front Row Motorsports on the up and up. Sounds like they're getting that manufacturer deal with Ford. Pretty big deal all around. That that team, Michael McDowell, Front Row Motorsports, and what he's done there has to be one of the, the craziest stories in global motorsports in the last three or four years. Their come up yeah. has been absolutely insane. Yeah. Um, some other big topics in the NASCAR world as we will get towards the end of NASCAR and switch to Formula One. Adam Stern reported that uh, Steve O'Donnell says that there's a fourth OEM discussion that's heating up and that Honda is in those talks. So we'll see. They did talk about potentially leaving IndyCar um, and sort of their dissatisfied IndyCar. So could well, this we, just be a ploy? Who knows? Um, I, it could be a negotiation tactic. I don't know. I mean, I think it's probably deeper than a negotiation tactic. I think that if NASCAR felt like they were being – used as pawns i don't think they would be commenting like that and giving yep. honda the satisfaction of the exposure so i think it's probably if if these conversations that are heating up that steve o'donnell's referring to are referring to honda i think they're probably legit and mm-hmm. honestly if you were to pick as an industry person if you were to pick one manufacturer that you wanted to join the fold honda might be it one of the top of that heap, wouldn't you say? Yep. Top five. Definitely in the world. They'd be a Who good one. Who else would you want to see if you could only pick one? Mm. Who's K- that who has the level money? of marketing budget is the key. You know, you want you want right. one that has the level of marketing budget that they would have. I mean, Stellantis, which is, you know, basically Dodge, would mm-hmm. be up there. You'd want them to come back, but they're basically making no cars now. Um, and they're switching everything to electric, and they're, they're going through an interesting time period. So I just, I don't know what their incentive would be to join you know, and then you have your luxury brands, which I just don't think fit with NASCAR. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they just, they're going to struggle. And that's, you know, your Mercedes, BMW, VW. You know, VW, 
I take that back. VW is one, obviously, Volkswagen, top three in the world in terms of manufacturers. They would be a wonderful one to have. Um, mm-hmm. Your sub, you know, your smaller brands, Hyundai, I think with their Elantra, their whole end division and being a part of IMSA in the Michelin Pilot series, mm-hmm. to me, has always looked like a um, an interesting one. I just don't know. I think their problem might be similar to Mazda in that it's a gargantuan spend. Mm-hmm. Um, they do have a WRC program, but I think you know having a NASCAR program as well. It's just a, it's a large, large spend. So as we've said before. My buddies at Mazda told me when they did the math, it was at least a hundred and fifty million dollar investment right off the bat, and probably one hundred fifty million per year to mm-hmm. do a NASCAR program at Cup Series. So, and to do it right, and I don't even know if that includes your your ancillary marketing budget to market that you're there, right? Which is what NASCAR wants is that you come in, and you don't just provide cars and engines and that sort of thing, but then you go and you do what Toyota does and Chevy and Ford, and that's buy commercials on the broadcast and support the tracks and do, you know, things in the midway and so on and so forth. So there's a lot that goes into it. Um, So we'll see, but that's, you know, it's always going to be a long term, take a long time because at the end of the day, these are massive deals that also can't just be committed to for one year at a time or two years. You got to come in here thinking you're going to do this for a decade, right? At least. Yeah. I mean, they have to design an engine. They have to, I mean, it's a huge, huge investment in our team. What is even, you know, here, here's everything. What is even the propulsion going to be in five years, right? Who knows right now? Mm-hmm. So, like, there, there's so many questions. I think it's it's a very tricky time to be in that situ- situation. Let's talk about tricky negotiations. Uh, yeah. The eve of the Daytona 500, the teams, the RTA announced that they have hired an antitrust lawyer. Uh, as they continue to go about this was this, charter this was as reported by discussion. Jennifer Fryer from AP. Sorry. So I don't, this yes. wasn't an announcement as much as um, it was a report from Jenna. Thank you for clarifying. I did that incorrectly. Um, this was a common discussion amongst everyone down in Daytona for all the days that were there. Unfortunately, it's continuing to be a discussion and will continue to be a discussion until it's figured out. But that is that you know the teams in NASCAR have still not come to agreement. They now hired this antitrust group to help them uh, to consult on this and they actually had a meeting where all the RTA owners or at least representatives met NASCAR was invited and NASCAR declined to come instead saying they would rather continue doing their one-on-one meetings with teams individually and that is where we're at with the charters so I it's a it is interesting to me I'm curious what um well we have no idea first of all because we're not lawyers and lawyers I have worked with lawyers. We're not? No, we no, we're not. I have Weird. worked with okay. lawyers in my life over several occasions, and I can tell you that lawyers can find stuff that you never knew existed in <laughs> contracts and all that stuff, right? And so, it is interesting to me. On one hand, I yeah, you know, I've always had this position of like, well, I don't see the leverage that the teams have, um, and I don't, I don't see the leverage that the teams have, but I can tell you that. This antitrust lawyer that uh, had reportedly was the same one that handled the women's soccer um, equal pay stuff. Uh, what else did this lawyer handle? Some pretty big the stuff. The NBA maybe? To... The NBA um, collective bargaining it, agreement or something? Yeah, NBA collective bargaining. There was some other big stuff that this lawyer handled. I can tell you that that lawyer handled whatever <laughs> leverage there is to find. I'm sure that lawyer will find it um, <laughs> if there is any. So that could make the story interesting, is what I'm trying to say. Um, the other thing that's interesting to point is NASCAR's strategy right now is obviously uh, divide and conquer when it comes to negotiating with the teams. Yep. So they're meeting with the teams individually. Um, so they're kind of pursuing, you know, they're still holding their what what do they call them quarterly team meetings. Um, but they're they've they're now they're pursuing these individual negotiations and discussions. Um, I even wonder if they're offering individual charter agreements. I don't know if they can do if they would do that or could do that or if they are doing that. Um, obviously, you know I think it's worth pointing out that you had a lot several teams in Daytona with these special hospitality spaces being used in the Cup Garage. Yep, um, and. I don't know who got permission or how they got permission. Did they pay for that? 
Um, are some teams friendlier with NASCAR than others right now? Because that's not a that wasn't a track thing that those teams had to coordinate. Um, that's something they probably had to coordinate with NASCAR um, to get to be able to host hospitality in the paddock. So or in a hot garage. So um, it makes me wonder if there's teams that are what like is NASCAR making progress in their divide and conquer? Um, what's really going on here? I don't know. Mm. But I will say those true. hospitality set uh, things were badass. I saw a couple of them. They were I know, awesome. So I walked cool. around. <laughs> they were so cool. They looked great. The the LED boards on the pit boxes on pit road looks awesome. You would never think some boards lit up would move a sport so far forward in the future, but it literally felt like NASCAR stepped 20 years advanced <laughs> from where it's been awesome. in, in the past. So it was great. The... The hospitalities were awesome. Twenty three eleven definitely won. Theirs looked the best by far. Uh, looked awesome. So well done to them. I had a discussion with a twenty three eleven member, and they were like, "Yeah, probably something we should do for the biggest races. Not sure how many more we'll get to do this at, but definitely something we should do the big ones." And I was like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm I would sure think it wasn't so. cheap either. No, I'm I'm sure not. They had a whole carpet down. And everything. It was it was really impressive. So carpets expensive. You know that. No, oh, yeah, can't can't mess with carpets. Um. Get in the carpet biz. That's where the money's at. Let's move on from NASCAR. Unless we missed anything. If you think we missed something, let us know either on the YouTube comments or write to us at friends at themoneylap.com and let us know. Also, go check out the Money Lap newsletter at moneylap.com. It's doing well. Just posted my um, Parker's POV from this past week. Uh, went out, goes out on Wednesdays, so that's always fun. Um, oh, Josh, wait a second. Our, our producer is obsessed with this. So he's obsessed with this, the yellow flag at the end of the race of the Daytona 500. And what the timing of it. <laughs> because he loves race control. I'm actually curious. Does anyone else out there care about debating race control as much as Josh? Probably not. Um, <laughs> to me, it's often a non-discussion when the cars mm-hmm. are flying up into the traffic of the racetrack. That's a mm-hmm. caution. Now, whatever you – you know, if you wait to throw it because – they go to the infield, and therefore they could possibly go to the the uh, make it to pit road and not hit anything. Yeah, why mm-hmm. not? They give it the best chance. But the second they start sliding up in the front of the field, I would have to think that's a caution. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not in race control, but I'd have to think that personally. If I'm in the cars, you know, depending on what that did for me, obviously I'm going to see it a different way. But from their position up in the tower, making a decision, two cars slide off in the inside. Hey, no, we got to throw a caution. Bam, there you go. Right? Like, you have two choices. Or it's the second a car goes, you throw it. But I don't think that's the right way to do it. I think that I, in real time, nobody has any reason to believe what I'm saying here, but I'm going to say it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I... Credibility in, at the Money Lab podcast. Thank I know. you very much. I, 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 in real time, watching this live, I'm pretty sure that I went through the same range of emotions and decision making on when it came to throwing a yellow as NASCAR did. Because the mm-hmm. moment I saw a car turn, my initial reaction was, "Oh, don't throw the, don't throw it, don't throw it. Let him race, let him race." And then a tenth of a second later, when they were past the start finish line and cars were coming back up the racetrack, I was thinking to myself, "Ah, shit, they're gonna have to throw it. Shoot, yep, that's it." And so I have no, I have literally no beef, no drama, no issue with what NASCAR handled, how NASCAR handled the yellow flag at the end of the race, other than it was a bummer. It was a bummer that they had to throw the yellow at all. It was a bummer that when they did throw the yellow, it was after the start finish line. We didn't get to see a restart. Like, yep. I just don't – of all the times that we get on Twitter and we roast NASCAR for being trigger happy, like, I just – yeah. It, it I think you plotted under- it out perfectly right there. That was that is everything in my mind was thinking the same thing, and it was probably the same as them. Do they want to mm-hmm. have a race under, end on your yellow? yellow? Absolutely not. No one does. They, they will sit there and tell you that's the worst outcome possible. But the other day – they have to do what's right safety wise. And they had the, probably the same thoughts. Oh, two cars go on the inside. Okay, they look nope, they're not good. 
throw it, you know, yeah. and there's your finish. And William Byron was in the deserving spot to win it, and that's the way it yeah, goes. Yeah, and plus it's a so. 24, and it's Hendrick, so, I mean, why not? Yeah. Like, come on. <laughs> Are you saying favoritism? <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just oh, joking. God. Wow. Uh, way by the way, can the record up. show that the 24 was my pick like on this he podcast was? several weeks ago? That's right. You did pick him to win. Not only did I pick the 24 to not just finish his first Daytona 500, but to win it. Wow. That is pretty damn – if you're a betting person out there and you're not listening <laughs> to the Money Lap podcast picks, he's what do you do in win- your life? He's also my pick for the championship. So You did say that. You said it's his year. And I remember that yep. I picked Kyle Busch. He looked really good early on. His race went to total shit uh, eventually. And Kyle's not he a Daytona 500 late. guy. No, he's gonna get it eventually. It was supposed to be 20 years of trying, but you know, 20 years of frustration getting it done. So, are we gonna move on from NASCAR because <laughs> there's some big news coming out of F1 that might surprise you from preseason testing? This is large. You can't take a lot of stock in it, but let's just put it this way. See, in 2025, Max Verstappen is 1.1 seconds faster than the field at the first day of testing here for the Formula One <laughs> World Championship. Um, all right. Well, that's about all we had to talk about. See you later. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. I don't, I don't want to just you can't say put a that ton of testing, stock in, by the way. testing speeds don't mean anything because yep. they don't. But... When you see that, it's like, well, what what else did we expect? But Here's if we side. saw – if Lando Norris was faster by a second, we would be sitting here saying, testing speeds don't mean anything. They were on a different strategy. They were – their car was not legal. You know what I mean? Like something was mm-hmm. going on there that was – the Red Bull cars were – had an anchor out, you know, for – they had a bunch of instruments on them for testing. I don't know. Who knows? Right? Pedo tubes, whatever. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like, Here's but the but here's the, the fact that Max part. is a uh-huh. But I'm I'm gonna put the lap time aside. The laps completed on the day. The winner? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Max Verstappen and Red Bull Racing at 142 laps. The next closest was uh George Russell from Mercedes at 121. Or no, I'm sorry, it's is that Mercedes or now, Yuki Sonoda? What are we looking at here? Because it says that Sergio Perez made zero laps and Lewis Hamilton he didn't run. made zero. He didn't run today. He'll run tomorrow. Okay. Basically. Okay. So Max There's made 142 switched. laps. They have one car? Yeah. Is that what they did? One car. Yeah. Some do morning and afternoon. Some do day to day. It just depends. But today was Max Verstappen's day. Lando Norris was in second. McLaren did look good. Ferrari looked pretty par for the course. Um, I saw our buddy Will Buxton, friend of the pod, put out sort of ranking order. He had Haas dead last, Williams just above them. So the pecking order really doesn't seem to have changed much in early testing. Now, you can't take a ton of stock in these, but to your point, if Red Bull and Max Verstappen are once again just in a gargantuan lead, uh, I think that is indicative of probably what you're going to see. The only cool thing from F1 uh, testing I did see is some of what is on the Red Bull car, have you seen this, where they went side podless like the mm-hmm. Mercedes tried to do? But then they actually have, like, inlets below the airbox in the center to the sides of the driver's head. It's actually pretty wild looking. Um, really, really cool. For the YouTube watchers, maybe we can throw up a picture of it if Josh finds one. But it does look really cool. Um, so something unique that so Adrian Newey possibly has found. creating, like... They're trying to create this just air channel between... I'm sorry. I know you asked me not to lean back. Uh, <laughs> I was leaning back, and then you can't hear me. So they're creating this air channel between what where the side pod would be and like the belly pan of the car, right? Yeah. Is that exactly. what they're trying to do? Yeah, and they're trying to just basically funnel the air differently. And those side pods have always been, you know, for years, it, you that know side pod existed. Like? If you close them up, the car goes faster. It's just a ton of drag. So it, it literally like them, where the Oracle is on the door. Or, I, I'll say on the door, the, where the on Oracle the door, logo is spot. on the side pod. Yep. Yep. Of the car. It literally looks like the, the tip of a wing on an airplane. Just upside mm. down or backwards, I guess, which I know is what you would want because you want the wing to make downforce, not lift. Yep. Um, in a F1 car, but it literally looks like the wingtip of an airplane 
um, now that it's no longer like this side pod, it's a, it's sort of detached from the, or somewhat kind of detached from the belly pan, I guess. It's interesting. Yeah, and then up behind the driver, at the edge of the halo, and below the airbox are these inlets, and then they have these massive tubes that kind of look so muscular behind them. It's It looks menacing. I'm not going to lie. It looks wildly menacing. Um, I didn't have. I, I didn't realize they had that kind of liberty right now with the rules to be able to design that. To you do to, a lot in that box, you just have to do it within the box, basically. So they're still figuring it out. It is racing. We're always finding ways to go faster. So Adrian Newey, cool. once again, what a what a boss figures it out. Finds it something that no one else is looking for. They got the king. For those who don't know, Adrian Newey, one of the most renowned designers in all of F1 history. Um, was at McLaren for many years when they were at some of their height in the early 2000s and then was taken over to Red Bull and obviously has majorly um, been a part of their success. But he has a great book out there as well called How to Build a Car, one of just the smartest people in motorsports, but still finding a way. And he always has been the one who's pushed the boundaries of like having the body work as close to the car and the engine and the, the – you know, all mm-hmm. the cooling functions as possible. So much so that back in his, the early 2000s McLaren, he had some cars that didn't work out because he went too aggressive. So he's just always been the one pushing the boundaries and once again has found something at Red Bull, which is pretty cool. If you're a betting person, then I've got a wager for you, Landon. We mentioned it earlier. <laughs> Friend of the pod, of the show, CEO Jeff Dodds of Formula E has said that he will bet – Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the charity of their choice. If Max Verstappen were not to win the F one twenty twenty four title, where's where's Vegas at on the field <laughs> for F one title right now? <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, it's gonna be very much in his favor. We'll have Josh look it up. Producer Josh can find it for us. Negative 500. So what's the field? What's the field, though? He's going to give it to us now. (laughs) Uh, Okay, so there's no field bet. But the next closest one is Lewis at plus 1,100. So if you bet $100 on Lewis Hamilton to win the world championship, you would win 1100 if he won it. Mm. So 10 to 1 odds, basically? Yep. Well, he's 11 to 1, basically. Or 11 to 1? Yeah. And Max is just wildly favored. Why you'd ever make that Lewis has better odds than Sergio. Perez. Yes. <laughs> driving a Red Bull, but yet that's interesting. That's the bet. Okay. Go for Sergio. That's the bet. I like that one. Um <laughs> well, I like putting that aside. I like this move by Jeff. Bring some attention to to Formula E and how competitive their racing is. Now, there are some out there that detractors are like, oh, I don't get why you would, you know, point out the bad things of a series to make yours this make does make you guys look any better. Sure, but why not have some fun? I'd love to see more banter amongst the racing series <laughs> I know. like this. It's, it's good fun. It's good fun. Yeah. Um, it's 250000 That is probably safe. <laughs> um, so whatever charity he was going to donate it to, sorry. But you're going to have to raise some money elsewhere somehow. He, <laughs> Yeah, he did, he did have a funny quote that it wouldn't be the worst day in the office that they've ever had. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Okay. There's been oh some gosh. bad days in Formula E. <laughs> oh my gosh! Then we are hoping oh. to send a representative to the Portland race when it happens. So. Um, we can't, uh, we can't wrap up our F1 segment without talking about Christian Horner, which I almost just said something else instead of Horner. But <laughs> uh, we don't know that. We, actually, I shouldn't even say anything like that because we don't really know. We don't know. We don't know. It's just been these Dutch rumors. Like it's. Something serious is going on, obviously. I'm not trying to yep. – I'm not minimizing anything by it. By it. It's just – I maybe I don't speak 
maybe I'm not, I don't, I don't, maybe I haven't been following it close enough. Has there actually been a real, there, has there, has there been anything real come out of it other than just we're investigating? There has not been. He was at the team launch. They were asked not to talk about it. He did bench. He did say that obviously there's an investigation going on, and he's fully complying with the investigation. There's now been this latest rumor that he attempted to pay six hundred fifty thousand dollars to sweep it under the rug. Look, it's all it, it, and it's, whatever it's it is sex, sexual misconduct allegations, right? And so there's been rumors yes. that it was a staffer, like his assistant, or yep. or something like that. But we don't know. Like it's it's just there, there's. I keep saying Dutch. Am I saying? Am I right by saying Dutch? Like all these yeah. sources keep coming from from some there, there's the Netherlands. Dutch, the Netherlands. Yep. That's where all these sources are coming from. Max, so with Max Verstappen. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, it's just very. It's very interesting, and I, well, I say very interesting. It, it just. It's. I don't know. It's kind of perplexing, but it is. Extremely dramatic. Uh, yeah. If, if this, uh, whatever comes out of this. Well, he's at testing. You know, it, it is a distraction. It's an undertone to what's happening. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, it sounds like people want more transparency. Total Wolf is quoted as saying he wants more transparency around all this. So it's. Are we definitely... getting to that point with it then where it's just like it's going on for so long? These reports keep coming out yet. And they, they, he's supposedly being investigated, but nobody knows why, what for. There's no official statement, and he's still at the racetrack, right? It's yep. it, like that's what bothers me about it, is like we're getting to the point where it's like, is it serious or is it not serious? Is something <laughs> happening, or is, or is this just getting over dramatized? Dram- Some you know, I would say overblown, but like, yep. because. <laughs> That's a good I mean, point. I guess I don't. Doesn't look like any legal charges have been filed against him, right? I suppose if legal charges were filed against him, then that would be much easier for F1 or Red Bull to step in and and you know suspend him. Yep. I I really don't know what there is to discuss because there isn't other than to there's say, nothing to discuss. There's, there's, there's nothing, nothing concrete. There's no yeah, facts. The only, we don't know anything. The only thing that you can put out there is just like from the racing perspective. They are rumbling towards the start of a season with this all, this cloud hanging over the whole thing, right? Let alone, you know, whatever he did or didn't do, whatever. The fact right. being that the race team as a whole has this hanging over it, right? And it's oh, just an totally. Odd, I mean, just imagine awkward, weird thing going on. Yeah, I mean, just imagine if they didn't have this distraction, they would have been two seconds faster than the field <laughs> in testing, and not just one. <laughs> You're bad. <laughs> So anyway, I, I would I would think and hope that we, you know, get some kind of resolution on this soon. I hate this kind of stuff. I hate it. Me too. It's so like I just it's disappointing if he if he was had some serious misconduct there. Um uh that would be heartbreaking to see that just I don't know, cuz it's wrong. And I want it I hate for that to be the focus of a motorsports headline. Don't really exactly. care to talk about it. Plus, you know, I I I uh, always thought the guy did has done an incredible job in running that race team and bringing it to where it was. So, I hate to see that if it's something that you know he's done that makes me uh, make us all think less of him. Anyway, we'll see where that goes. Uh, last bit from Global Motorsports before we close out this week's podcast. Of course, go check out the MoneyLap dot com. Uh, MotoGP. We've talked about the Arrow and how they've started mm-hmm. to sprout wings, and the latest Ducati looks like a literal F fourteen as opposed to a motorcycle. Mm-hmm. Um, but with Arrow does come speed, and they set a new track record at the Losail oh. at the Qatar set, uh, circuit in Losail, and um, you just. Like we said earlier, before last That's time we talked about it, you can't put the genie back in the bottle when it comes yep. to aero stuff. So it's exciting right now to see these things. I think it's cool. Well, I mean, I say that there's they've already had their share of, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Speculation or or pause, I guess. But um, it is cool to see that technology. But just friendly reminder that you can't unlearn aerodynamics. Yes. 
and it was Peko Bagnaya who shattered the track record. Um, which is <laughs> just As if those things needed to go any faster. Exactly. I know. And they just, they look <laughs> wild right now. I mean, this bike, if we throw a photo up, whatever, or if you just need to search the Ducati at testing in 2024, it just looks absolutely insane. So right. I think we covered it all in the motorsports world, Len. Um, are we missing anything? Um, I'm good to go, man. Well, if you're watching this on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe. We're out of time here at the Money Lap. Oh, next time, Kyle. We'll get Kyle Bush on next time. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Money Lap. As always, check out themoneylap.com for the best five minutes in motorsports or sometimes just the coolest stuff in motorsports. Delivered directly to your inbox three times a week. Check us out on YouTube. We're growing fast over there. And, of course, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram. We're all over the Internet. We're spreading the word of how cool motorsports is. Check us out.